Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus. This is our new series on internet obsession. The first episode in that series. So subscribe, make sure you get all the episodes. The next one will be next Thursday. If you haven't watched Seeker Plus, we take a big topic and we break it into chunks so that we all understand it a little bit better. So today we're gonna to explore this connection obsession, but not in the way that you normally get it explored. We're not gonna talk about rehab or any of those things. Uh, we are going to talk about how people spend a thousand hours on Instagram and how they get us to do that, or like a million hours on Wikipedia, because I'm on it all the time. How people get addicted to the internet is a really important question for the modern times, and it has to do with a lot of different factors in psychology and design and engineering. So we're going to explore the science of all of these different things. So let's kick into it. Think about being in an elevator, right? that awkwardness that you have. Maybe you started talking to them outside the elevator, now you're in the elevator, you don't wanna to talk to them anymore, so your hand starts creeping toward your pocket or your purse and you pull out your little phone device. Not for any reason, you just pull it out for something to stare at. Does that mean that you're addicted to your phone? Even if you recognize it and you don't have a reason for looking at it, when you check your notifications when there aren't any, you know there aren't any, it's been five minutes, but you pull it out and look at it anyway, you ask yourself why? We can't really call it internet addiction. It's not actually diagnosable. But there are people that are starting to recognize this, as I'm going to call it, internet obsession. Today, designers hook you into their systems using psychology and behaviorism. They have no laws to stop them from doing this. And they design it this way on purpose to keep you coming back again and again. They want you to want more and hopefully spend real money inside of their systems. There's a guy who is a game economist, and his name I cannot pronounce, but it's Raman Shokrizade. And he told NPR, as you play video games or surf websites, they are tracking your clicks, they are running tests, they're analyzing the data. Right now, wherever you are listening to this, it's served up to you via a computer network. That computer is listening to you listen to this. It's figuring out how you're listening and how long, whether you listen at two times or regular times or even slower for some reason, whether you're listening in a car or walking around. It can learn so much about you, and they're pooling all that data with the billion other people who are using their services all the time. The YouTube algorithm wants you to spend time on their website. They look at everything you watch, how long, when you leave, what videos you like, things you comment on. They try to guess what else that you would like to keep you coming back to YouTube.com. Netflix does the same thing. Do you ever notice that your thumbnails are different on your Netflix than they are on your parents or on your partners? That is on purpose. The Netflix global manager of creative services said that, quote, artwork was not only the biggest influence to a member's decision to watch content, but it also constituted over 82% of their focus while they browsed Netflix. You spend an average of 1.8 seconds on each one of their key art, the little thumbnails of Stranger Things and whatever else. You spend 1.8 seconds on each one before you make a decision. They know that and they're tracking it. Facebook knows how long that you stop on something to gaze at it. Whether you like it, whether you click on it, whether you watch the video, whether you do anything, they know that you stopped scrolling to look at it. They know that. They do this and they learn about you so that they can make you spend more time on their websites because that time is their business model. They do this with three big things, data, research, and behavior. I call these the three H's. They keep you coming back with the three H's, happiness, habituation, and hella data. And I, had to, I had to get another H, okay? I had to get another one. First, let's go with happiness. Every brain has a reward system. It comes built in, it's in our wetware. It helps you get out of bed in the morning, helps you get interested in social interaction, keeps you interested in things like food and sex. It also is associated with things like drugs. But laughing and friendly interactions and encouragement when you do things correctly, those all have to do with dopamine. It's a neurotransmitter and it's part of the reward system. So just quick dopamine sidebar. I'm gonna try and make this as quick as possible. So Science Media Literacy 101. When someone says that dopamine is addictive as cocaine or something like that, that's a little disingenuous because dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and all these other brain neurotransmitters, they're, they're released from the brain's reward system. 
They're doing it all the time. And so when we say something is as addictive as cocaine, what we're really saying is the brain's only reward system is squirting out these hormones that make you feel a certain way. So when it comes to things like uh, your crush, you maybe made them laugh at your joke, that's gonna release some dopamine from parts of your brain. When you ingest your favorite food, that's gonna release dopamine from parts of your brain. When you make friends, that's gonna release dopamine from parts of your brain. And when you do your drug of choice, that's gonna release dopamine mean from parts of your brain, but a lot more of it. It's sort of like hacking your brain a little bit. So there are a lot of problems with saying that dopamine has to do with cocaine and other things. So just know that when you read it. That's end media sidebar there. So dopamine is very important when it comes to the brain's reward system. It's one of the more well-known neurotransmitters. So we're just going to use that as kind of a shorthand of saying your reward system squirts out chemicals like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. And it's too complicated to just say that is happiness or that is addiction, but it plays a big part in it in your head. So a reward is a reward, whether it's a lot or a little. So the second H is habituation. And this has to do with psychology, specifically behavioral psychology. Psychology is the study of us and how we tick. And this is a pretty big deal. Dopamine makes you comfortable. It helps you anticipate things so that you can have that reward, and it gives you that certainty of happiness when you get it. In the 1930s, there was this guy, B.F. Skinner, and he invented this concept of behavioral psychology. He created something called operant conditioning. It's behavioral science. It's actually a psychology that is empirical. You can study it with conditions and have external and internal validity. Um, I, full disclosure, have an undergrad degree in this specific uh, type of science. And essentially what happens is you give a hungry rat food when it presses a lever in a box, right? That rat has now learned to associate food with the lever press. It only works when the rat is specifically hungry, so what they usually do is they don't actually use food. Sometimes they'll use water or some other reward. But the point is that they can teach these animals how to do this and explore this science. So B.F. Skinner did this in what's called the Skinner box with pigeons. And you can use a time interval to study this interaction. So you get a pigeon to peck a specific spot, and then you give it some food. And it pecks it again, and it gets some food. And it pecks it again, and it gets some food. And then over time, you change what behavior you require to get the food. So say, a time interval change. You can only get food once every 60 seconds. No matter how many times you peck that spot or hit a button or whatever, you don't get any food until it's been 60 seconds. The pigeon and the rat, they can figure that out. They can learn that, oh, there's no reason to waste my energy. I'm not going to get food for a while. So they wait, they peck or push the lever or whatever, they get their food. However, there is another condition, and that's a variable time interval. So imagine instead of saying every 60 seconds the rat's going to get food, you add a variable. So you say between 30 and 200 seconds, somewhere in there, if you peck or push the lever, you get food. What happens here is the subject inside the Skinner box goes crazy. When Skinner did this with pigeons, one pecked 87,000 times in 14 hours because uncertainty is a nightmare when it comes to behaviorism. They weren't sure when they were going to get the food. It was it 30 seconds? Was it 200 seconds? Now I have to peck constantly because I just don't know when the food is coming. How many likes are you going to get on your next Instagram post? You have no idea. So you better post one and then post one again, and then post one again, and then post one again. Because you want to make sure that you get more certainty, not more uncertainty. There was actually a study of this. Uh, 32 students at UCLA submitted photos to researchers, and the researchers put them into an fMRI and faked the number of likes those photos got. They said that the photos had more likes than they really did, and then they looked at their brains and where the blood was flowing, that's what an fMRI does, a functional magnetic resonance imager does, is it maps the blood flow in your brain. They found that the fMRI lit up in the striatum, which is a little reward part of your brain, a little sassy bit, and they found that lots of likes equaled more likely to click on a picture. They also found more blood flow to the social and visual regions of the brain. Now they're doing this to understand why we like Instagram so much. What does it do for us? And it triggers those little reward systems in our brain that make us want to do that thing and anticipate that reward.
right? And it also ticks the boxes in social and visual inside of our brain as well, which we have evolved to like. We've been trained to respond to social interaction by dopamine, by a social interaction reward from that dopamine, and by each other. When we interact with each other out here in the real world, we get that same dopamine reaction. And the brain is too stupid to understand the difference when we see it online. So a marketing firm, Rhythm One, formerly called Radium One, uh, released a study that said, quote, every time we post, share, like, comment, or send an invitation online, we are creating an expectation. Emotion is a big driver, and dopamine helps drive that. Expectation of a new video release is exciting. When you know that your favorite YouTuber is about to release a video, that's great. When your favorite television show is about to come on, that's exciting too. But not as strong as things on the internet where they're designed to know that you're feeling that way as well. So now we get to the third H, hella data. So we had happiness, habituation, Hella data. Devs or developers of apps and websites, they use the data of your dwell time, how long you're looking at a thing without actually interacting with it. Watch time, how long, say, you watch a video. Session time, which means as soon as you log on to Facebook servers and start looking at all their stuff, and then when you leave Facebook servers, they look at all of that. They look at your likes, your loves, whether you laughed at a thing, whether you, you know, interacted with it in a different way, whether you commented, whether you scrolled by it, messages that you're sending, emails that you're sending, notification clicks. Your attention is worth a lot of money to them. So they take that data and they use it to try and get more of your attention. Plus, we know from earlier in this piece that brains get rewards from things. They also get rewards from social interactions, little puzzles, sexy things, anticipation, pleasing sounds, music, cute visuals like babies and friends, dogs and stuff like that, laughter and tears and all sorts of other social interactions. And knowing that, they can mine all of the data of the 3.2 billion people that are on the internet and they find all sorts of correlations. We use the overlap of what we know that we like, of the dopamine in our brains being released in certain ways, and then they program things to fit it. Sounds a lot like games and social media, right? They don't always admit that they do this. And every time the different developers and programmers and groups update a game or they release a new thing, they're testing something. Whether that thing is a behavioral science or not depends on the website. You know, we can't say that every website does this all the time. But there are lots of websites, especially the ones that traffic and attention, that are using these techniques constantly. Actually, to be honest, Seeker does this. Facebook lets us A-B test different concepts. So we can release the same video onto Facebook with two different thumbnails or two different titles and see which one performs better. It's like a micro experiment that we can run on you guys. So to that end, let's kind of back up and go back to that awkward elevator interaction right? You didn't feel that vibrate of your phone, so you know you didn't get a notification, but you want to pull that phone out anyway, right? It's awkward in here. I got to pull my phone out. I'm in, I'm in a ride share with other people. I got to pull my phone out. I got to put my headphones in. I got to, I got to look at this thing. Maybe next time, just, just for fun, just for fun, resist the feeling to pull it out. Resist the feeling to take your phone out of your pocket and look at it. Think about that feeling. Where did that feeling come from? Think about how it feels. And then maybe think about how you've judged or discussed addiction in the past. Researchers have found that a lot of people who feel addicted to their phones and addicted to these games, they have similar discussions as people who are addicted to gambling. And gambling has been studied a lot when it comes to the brain. So just think about gambling and how it relates to this for a second. Games like at casinos have little sound effects, they have little graphical sparkles, you progress through the games and, and you slowly get rewards, but slowly and managed. It does sound a lot like mobile gaming. And you can actually fight this. Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and all of these games and websites, they make things that are time-based so that you return to them, like events and birthdays, coins and you know build times where you have to wait 20 minutes and come back. You gotta wait for that new restaurant or whatever. You, know, you gotta wait until your campsite's been updated and Animal Crossing. So the idea is they can get you to return and anticipate that reward. 
So pro tip, if you want to get over your internet obsession, turn all those notifications off. It's as simple as that. Only open an app when you want to open it. And try and keep track of that. How often are you opening these apps? Maybe put some of the apps that you feel like you're addicted to on a different page of your phone or in a folder. Or make it so you can't easily access them. So you have to actually make an effort. You notice when it's happening. It becomes less of a kind of muscle memory. Going cold turkey is not really great for any kind of obsession, but you can gradually decrease your time until you feel like it's a healthier amount. And eventually, maybe you'll be in the elevator and won't feel the pull of your pocket. I did a lot of this and it helped me a lot. If you have any questions or want other advice, feel free to tweet at me. At least, if I'm going to be screen addicted, I kind of want to better myself, so I put learning and reading apps on my main page so that I read the news a lot more. Now I'm feeling like I'm a little news obsessed, but you know, it's a, it's a constant journey. <laughs> As one of my favorite authors, Jack Vance, wrote in a piece called Inferio, quote, happiness is fugitive, dissatisfaction and boredom are real. So what do you think we should do? Again, tell us down in the comments. Come back next week to find out more about how this internet obsession is not just affecting us when we're in an elevator or in a cab, but it's changing the world around us. It's gonna be really interesting. Fun fact, I did actually have a rat lab in my undergrad. Um, the Skinner box is still used today to help psychology students understand the practical aspects of behavioral psychology. Super cool. Thanks for watching or listening to Seeker Plus, everyone. Come say hey on Twitter or Instagram. You can find us at Seeker, and you can find me at Trace Dominguez. We'll see you next week.